after all these years, someone actually paid to advertise at the start of my videos. Uh, I personally think it's a big waste of money considering I upload once like every five years or whatever it is currently, but hey, it's up to them, right? Just a heads up, there's going to be like those five second ads a couple more times in the future, and then we probably won't do them again. So while it's there, hey, click the link at the bottom and check out the guy's creep hoodie in the workshop. Just if you get it, don't wear it next to a Doom cosplayer or else they'll straight up vore you IRL. I've seen it happen. Mars, a type of chocolate bar, the Roman god of war, and the final resting place of the interplanetary rover, Opportunity. Rest in peace, little buddy. In fact, if you zoom in really close on Mars' base model, you can- Oh my god, look, there's a little robo gravestone, how sad! Every once in a while, Ice Frog looks over and sees that nobody's playing as new heroes because they're all too hard and complex and nobody opened up Dota to do trigonometry, so the guy just sort of shrugs and releases an easy hero. And now Mars is the third most popular character in the entire game. So good strategy, Ice Frog. In just under a month, people seem to have started playing him, burned through every awful, awful build that's been thrown at him, overcome them all, and all collectively decided on the best and basic way to play him. You got your Faze, and your Vlads, and your BKBs, and your strength utility items. They're, you know, done and dusted. No need for a guide. But what if there was one awful, awful build that people hadn't discovered yet? Today on The Only Way to Play, we're gonna find it. Just in case you've been living under a rock, or perhaps just in case you're a veteran subscriber to this YouTube channel back from when I made Minecraft videos all those years ago, and so have absolutely no idea what Dota is, Mars was the latest hero added to the game Dota 2. We're about a month into his reign now, and we've been hit with the first update since his appearance. I feel like because of that, it's a good time to talk about him, knowing that now his abilities have sort of been tweaked enough for Ice Frog to be seemingly okay with him for the next wee while. At the beginning of March, Mars was added to the game. At that point, he was a strength hero with extremely high strength gain, 3.6, I think. He had pretty high HP, level 1, not the highest. He had good damage, he had good range, especially considering he's, you know, not a ranged hero. What is it with Ice Frog giving melee heroes more range than a leveled up Templar Assassin? I d but I guess I get the logic. If you have a big enough stick, you can conquer anything. Along with his above average range and damage and health and movement speed, Mars also originally had perfectly easy spells to get your head around. You don't understand how lucky you all are for a hero in 2019 to have that. He was given a sturdy stun, an enemy repositioning spell, he was given a critical damage dealing AoE physical spell, he was given the ability to tank an immense amount of attack damage coming at him from the front and slightly to the side, and best of all, he was given the ability to trap enemies, separate enemies, pin enemies down, disrupt enemies in a team fight, and also, in the same skill, Mars was given the ability to create very, very helpful Venn diagrams to show the total number of enemies that will soon be dead. Hint, it's the one in the middle. Man oh man, when he was first added, Mars was given everything, right? <laughs> Wrong! Because even though Mars was showered in all of these damaging and utility spells and abilities, he, he wasn't given any goddamn mana to cast any either. Spear of Mars, his Q, costs 100 mana on a 14 second cooldown. God's Rebuke was 70 total with a 10 second cooldown. Arena of Blood has a 200 mana cost, and at the earliest point where you could have all of these spells cost these exact amounts, level 7, you'd need level 7 to max out God's Rebuke, you would have, in total, a mana pool of exactly 375. Oh wait, but didn't I just say it was 100 for Q plus 70 for W plus 200 for his ult? Isn't that exactly 370? Which means that it's just under his total amount? Well first off, Yes, but that's not a good thing. Just because he can cast his spells once with his mana pool doesn't mean he's fine. And secondly, oop, they just patched the shit out of it right now because now he can't do that anyway. Because now, he can't cast all of his spells with his mana pool. In 721D, released three weeks later, they cut all of that shit right out and now God's Rebuke is 80 mana per cast at level 4 rather than 70. Those 10 mana points have destroyed everything. So what do you do? I think you'll like the answer, but you'll probably not like how long you'll have to wait for it. There's a lot of explaining we have to do beforehand, like how after 721D, Mars' strength gain was dropped from 3.6 to 3.2, which is, you know, probably for the best. When new players instantly pick up Mars and manage to fail their way all the way to a win, just by virtue of him being effortlessly powerful, you've probably got a problem. The guy's had a consistent above 50% win rate since a few days after he was introduced, and it's only been steadily rising. Along with that, his Spear of Mars AoE was reduced from 500 to 300. Before this update, when you cast Spear of Mars into the Fog of War, it would give you flying vision around it for 500 range. Now it's 200 less. Yeah, sure, that's, that's fine. Mars's level 20 talent, that we didn't even really get to talk about yet, has already been reduced. One of the options is for Spear of Mars to deal what was previously 1.5 seconds extra stun, but what is now simply plus 1. But it's still better than the alternative of the same spell dealing extra damage. 
We'll talk about that later. The crown and glory though is of course that God's Rebuke is now 80 mana. Your spammable Anchor Smash-esque AoE Wave Clear spell costs over a fifth of all of your mana. You can cast the spell in order to get last hits five times. Go see for yourself what you can buy with five last hits. I'll speed this up because now that I think about it, the odds are that most people clicking on a video called The Only Way to Play Mars probably already understand who Mars is. What you might not know is what he does best. Mars is the god of war, so from a realism standpoint, he should be the hardest of carries, right? But trying to make sense of Dota through the lens of realism is an exercise in futility. If Dota were realistic, you wouldn't see a redhead who's good at archery winning against literal embodiments of chaos. Also, if Dota was wanting to be like real life, all of the gods wouldn't exist. Obviously, I'm kidding. Contrary to my Steam name, I'm far from edgy. I just like those speaker-splitting bass hits, and I just wanted to have an excuse to play one. I'm actually a believer in the belief that anyone can believe in anything. You can believe that the Oracle Guide will come out soon, as much as that'll help you. My one caveat for right now is that you might be idolizing an inherently improper idea if you believe Mars is in any way an offlaner. Bet you didn't see that coming. Mars likes killing people. He doesn't like getting killed by people. With this amazing discovery, we can uncover every counter to Mars and every hero that Mars himself counters. But no, in all seriousness, Mars is the sort of hero who enjoys man-fighting heroes. Heroes like Ursa, Legion Commander, like PA and TA. He just stops liking them once they're hitting him too hard, like in the case of OD, Huskar, and Slark. With Mars's kit, he naturally finds himself countering heroes who deal attacks of the physical variety, as well as magical, even pure. Until he doesn't. What I mean by this is that with Arena of Blood and Bulwark and really Mars' entire kit, he ends up relying completely on the idea that you won't want to fight him. You'll want to run away. He's sort of like Ricky in that sense. And the way to beat Ricky is to turn around and face him and stand your ground. Every part of you is telling you to run. Oh no, it's a Ricky. He has more damage than you. Oh no, he's cast smoke. I'm missing every single one of my attacks. If, 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 if I was to run away right now, I should be fine. If I just step out of the smoke, I would be fine. But no because that's the trap. Ricky wants you to do that. The spell is designed around the fact that Ricky can rely on you wanting to do that. Ice Frog balanced it in that way. So Ricky, like Mars, ends up countered by literally doing nothing but auto attacking him. Another beautiful example of the concept of pushing less buttons to win more games. Take that APM fanatics. Mars erects a deadly arena of inescapable torture. Well, uh, like, inescapable unless you can escape. It turns out that that's surprisingly easy, but enough on that. He can spawn an arena that kills you if you approach the walls, and then he charges at you with his passive bulwark, meaning that you can only do 30% attack damage to him. It reduces the other 70%. But 70% isn't 100%. You are doing damage. You just have to conquer this notion that his passive prevents any damage. Like Ricky, it's just a psychological trick to make you not want to attack him. So internalize it and attack him anyway. If he pushes you towards the walls, just sidestep. If he hits you with God's Rebuke, do not panic at the amount of health that you have just lost. It doesn't mean he's about to kill you. It means he no longer has God's Rebuke. It's a 10 second cooldown and you can live for 10 seconds. Avoid the walls, avoid fleeing, and then start sidestepping like a madman because the one thing he has left to fuck you up can miss. With Arena of Blood active, you can't walk so far out that you can outrange Spear of Mars. You can't do that. Even if he was on the very opposite edge of the arena from you. Heck, even if he was outside of the arena from it. Which, remember, is possible. So much time with Monkey King's ult has probably conditioned you to think that Arena of Blood will break when you leave it too. But still, even with that amount of range, you still won't have enough room while in the circle to guarantee you'll dodge it. And if you are hit by it, you will probably die. So let's make sure you play it in the best way possible to not get hit. And, much like everything in this mini guide of how to counter a Mars, it seems to boil down to doing the exact opposite of what your instincts are telling you to do. Here, yeah. mathematically, and you know the section's getting really sexy when you hear that word dropped, but mathematically, when unable to produce enough distance between you and Mars to allow for sidestepping a moving spear of Mars, you actually have the best chance of not being hit by running up and hugging him. Let me explain. So your move speed is pretty much like somewhere between 100 and 550. Let's ignore spells that mess that statement up, although you'll find that they probably will only really be able to help you for this. Uh, Mars has a turn rate of 0.8 or 1 with phase boots, which is above average. He will turn completely around in 0.236 seconds. He will take 0.25 seconds extra to cast Spear of Mars. Spear of Mars has a 125 collision size that you must avoid to survive this. The closer you push yourself to the center of his circle of influence, namely right on top of him, the faster you can traverse the circumference of a circle around him. And that's the key to dodging him. 
Run the fuck around in circles, pause randomly, start running in the other direction, flip back and run the other way again. Be completely unpredictable. Push yourself completely up against him and make him whiff his Spear of Mars because he couldn't track your movements fast enough to catch you. Spear of Mars, unlike most spells of its type, cannot hit enemies behind Mars upon cast. Will this work every time? No. Could this save your life when there's nothing else that you can do? Yes. And that's the beauty of it. It only needs to work once to actually work. And to give this insanity a bit of credence, have you ever tried to hook someone as Pudge only to miss because they were too close to you? And you don't need to answer that, because I know you have. Mars is a hero who can lane anywhere. He can go anywhere and break even. So when you're given the option to go anywhere you ever want, what don't you do? I mean, people win with him offlane, mid, as a hard carry, and as a support. So if all five possible positions in the hero hierarchy are possible, what is the least right one? I guess that might just depend on who you're up against. I think it's time for the Pearl Pyramid. Mars looks like a Disney hero. There, I said it. Now everyone else can stop saying it. I have said it, and now it's official. We know. Mars looks like a Disney hero. Also, his opening intro has him showing his might by taking out like three melee creeps. Wow, I'm sure you'll strike fear in the hearts of many with that move. Basically, Valve throws Mars in with no actual demonstration of his purpose or place in this world, which is a good thing for all of us awful, awful guide makers because we get to cash out on those extra couple of dollars the YouTube gods deign to bestow upon us mere mortals. Because Ice Frog won't tell you, I guess I get to tell you. Mars is countered by. Hit it, Sammy! <laughs> Pulling up the Power Pyramid, we should immediately throw three heroes up with so, so much burst damage. Timbersaw, Anti-Mage, and Outward Devourer sit comfortably at the very top of all 114 heroes that can go up against Mars. And unlike most other Power Pyramids, all three of those heroes do so in a different way. Where Timbersaw deals just so, so much damage, Anti-Mage and OD burn mana. Where OD can hide either Mars or himself for four of the five to seven seconds of Arena of Blood, Timbersaw and Anti-Mage can blink out. Where Anti-Mage can go one-on-one -on -one against Mars and survive because of high armor, or even tank Spear of Mars into Arena of Blood because of magic resistance, Timbersaw and OD can deal so, so much damage. That's a full circle. Now let me explain, because to a few of you, I just said something really, really strange. Maybe some didn't catch it, but I said Timbersaw can escape from Arena of Blood. And no, I don't mean with like any item tricks, like just buying Blink Dagger and BKB. If I meant that, then, you know, any hero can escape from Arena of Blood. No, what I meant was that Timbersaw with his normal kit can escape Arena of Blood. All he does is Timber Chain out. And there I go being wrong twice in the span of a few sentences. How smart of you for pointing that out to me. I mean, of course I'm wrong. Timber Chaining out of Arena of Blood causes this to happen. Until it doesn't. Because check it out. There's a massive oversight with Arena of Blood that I don't really think any fucker is talking about. It doesn't stun you, spoiler alert, but in the skill build segment we were going to find out that Arena of Blood has a 1 second interval between attacks, and there's 14 spear boys that border the arena. That 1 second interval counts for just one of those boys. If you're really unlucky you can be hit by all 14 sequentially if the stars align, perhaps if a bat rider hooks you up and just drags you around the circle, but that's horribly cruel. Because that one spear boy is out of commission for 1 second, there is absolutely nothing to knock you back upon running at him again. Sure, the arena itself has a slowing aura, meaning that forced movement spells that, like, modify your movement speed, like Force Staff and Pike, Sunray, Skewer, and I think only those spells. Well, the arena walls, you know, themselves stop that because they just bring your move speed to zero. But every other movement speed item and spell in the game works, without fucking question. Because Arena of Blood does not work the way everyone says it does. Watch me, in all of this time I've just been jumping around with Timbersaw breaking the game by deliberately running into a spear boy to push me back, but more importantly to take him out of commission, whereupon I aim straight through that one boy and that one boy alone and it's like right on out because he isn't able to pop back up and punt me back. If I miss, the boys on his flank will push me back for him, and if I'm too slow, he'll refresh and push me back himself. But for 0.8 seconds, in between that first hit, but after the negligible 0.2 second knockback, if I aim and get right in between those two active spear boys, boys and just go straight through the one that's out of commission, I am free to simply waltz on out of there. And look at me go. Now you might understand why Timbersaw is Mars's worst counter and able to share top tier with the likes of Mana Burn Behemoths of the OD and Anti-Mage variety. Timbersaur is scary. 
Under those three special cases, we have an entire tier dedicated to heroes that stop him using spells. Mana burners like PL and the Diffuser Blade wielding Slarks fill the slot nicely, along with the natural mana burner brothers like Keeper of the Light and Lion. But also in the slot, you'll find heroes with breaks to deal with that one last spell that doesn't cost mana. And so by heroes with breaks, we obviously mean just Viper, the only hero with innate break. Luckily for us, he's just got plenty to compensate for everyone else's lack. Near the Toxin pretty much perfectly fits the area of Arena of Blood, and getting rid of Bulwark is if you really think about it, a 230% damage increase for just 70 mana. If you're dealing 30% damage and then you gain back 70% to get you back to 100% of your original, uh, aren't you now dealing 233% extra damage? I mean, you began at 30%, 70% more is earth shattered. Without bulwark, what is Mars but a low on mana, low on defenses hero who just decides to lock you into a dingy old arena with him and no shield? You can't forget your shield. If history's battles have taught us anything, you can't forget your shield. Heroes with silences could also slot nicely into this section if their silences were permanent. Unfortunately, none are, I guess, other than Doom, but Doom counters everything. So while stopping Mars from casting his spells is admirable, stopping them forever is better. And that's what Mana Burn does. And finally under that are heroes with just lots and lots of magical damage. Not even actually magical damage, specifically damage dealt through spells. Attacks that have auto-casted spell modifiers don't count. I mean, they're attacks, so they get reduced by bulwark. Nearly all heroes with a modifier have that restriction, unfortunately. Nearly everyone, except for... Oh, right. Outworld Devourer again. You know, the guy from the top tier? Outworld Devourer is odd. His arcane orb deals two instances of damage. Now that in and of itself isn't really that odd. Some modifiers do that. One is the actual physical attack, and the other one is arcane orb, which is specifically coded to be a spell that goes off at the exact same time an enemy is hit. Now let me rephrase that. A spell that goes off at the exact time an enemy is hit. All other modifiers work by either adding the bonus damage of that hit, e.g. Kunkus Tidebringer, or they work in such a way that they deal two attack damage instances, one of the normal physical attack that deals normal, you know, physical damage, and another attack that deals the damage that the skill says to, e.g. Enchantress's Impetus dealing a second hit of distant based pure damage, and Doom's Infernal Blade dealing a stun and burn damage. But those spells deal them as if they were second attacks. They don't technically count as spells. Because of the way the game was coded, to allow for an old Outworld Devourer to be able to proc his old passive, Essence Aura, on his spells and Arcane Orb way back where no one else could, on account of Arcane Orb and other spells being attack modifiers, the game had to be coded to call Arcane Orb a spell. And even though Essence Aura is long gone, its legacy remains. Arcane Orb maintains its quirky status as an attack and a spell, and because of that, Mars is doomed. If Mars tried to buck up and charge at an OD, much like if he tried to take on a spell-based tinker or an exorcism casting death prophet, Mars would die. Magic damage beats Mars, which interestingly enough uh, means that the biggest of the magic damage nukers can come strolling in at the bottom of the pyramid too. And it's his father, Zeus. This is mighty awkward. Yes, even in the Dota universe, Mars is the son of Zeus. I mean, they're getting their Roman and Greek mythology mixed up. In Roman, Zeus is Jupiter, and in Greek, Mars was Ares, I think? But the point still stands. Someone, oh god, please, someone call CPS, because Mars's dad beats him. And pretty well at that. On the flip side of all that, Mars ends up countering quite a few heroes himself. Not ultra hard in the sense that these heroes can never be picked up against Mars, mind you. Mars is like Vengeful Spirit. No heroes are horribly countered by them, by one or two that crumble against them, but they are both very, very sturdy picks that can get a slight edge over nearly every other hero in the game. They're dependable, they can be picked first, which in, you know, Mars's case can be shown firsthand. If you don't pick him first, you don't get to play him at all currently because some other boy or girl snuck in there before you. He's very, very popular. Bear in mind, this is being written a month after he was added. So that's still quite the feat. Nobody, nobody was playing Oracle a month after he was added. Same with Grimstroke. The heroes that Mars truly does counter though are... Hit it, Sammy Jr. Sammy Sr. died during the last segment. We're all very, very sad about it. Clinks, Wind Ranger, Drow Ranger, and ironically, the aforementioned Vengeful Spirit. All four of these heroes are ranged physical DPS dealers. As we all get better and better at understanding the possibilities of Arena of Blood, we'll find all of us more ways to absolutely destroy the potential of any hero that fits that description. Arena of Blood blocks all incoming attacks from outside of the arena, and ranged heroes inside the arena lose the benefit of their hero. I mean, ranged heroes are unanimously more fragile than melee heroes. That's why they're ranged, to compensate. Throwing up an arena of blood and finding yourself face to face with a ranged hero who can literally not escape your grasp, can, it, it can make you happy. 
Fun fact, if you stand exactly in the middle of the arena, because of your 250 attack range, it is literally impossible to not be able to reach someone in that arena who are themselves trying to avoid the damage dealing pushing back Border Patrol team. Right below that, if you have heroes that deal physical damage that just can't compete with your attack damage reduction, uh, they will go on the list too. Think of all those man fighters that secretly want you to run away from them for their abilities to actually work. The obvious example of this is uh, clearly Bloodseeker, who literally wants you to run away from him in order for his rupture to work. But that's the beauty of it. Mars can stand his ground, pivoting on the spot so as to always face danger, but never taking rupture damage because he isn't technically moving any units. He's just rotating on the spot. And then Mars just bulwarks off all of Bloodseeker's admittedly hefty physical attack damage. Because that's how Mars do. This translates to Ursa too. Although, Fury Stripes still kind of work. And my favourite, Legion Commander. Because of course, obviously, Legion Commander dueling you makes you and her face each other. When you face her, you pull out your shield and take 70% less damage. And if you thought it couldn't get any better, you're happily, happily mistaken. Because Mars even counters the counter to man fighters. Mars counters Phantom Assassin, just like he counters Wind Ranger and Brewmaster and all other forms of evasion based heroes. Because Arena of Blood is magic damage and can't miss, because Spare of Mars is magic damage and stuns for up to 3 seconds, and because God's Rebuke gives True Strike. Hot damn! A fun little trick you can do is to bait Troll Warlord into battle trancing near you, whereupon he's lost the ability to control his hero anymore, and then you can sort of cast Arena of Blood, step outside of it, and then have Troll Warlord try and fail a million times to get to you, all the while taking hit after hit after hit of Arena of Blood damage. And then for the third tier, Mars enjoys kicking back and enjoying farming dozens and dozens of teeny little creeps with his huge God's Rebuke, Cleaving Nuke. In fact, it's I, th I, th I think it's disingenuous to call it a cleave. As we'll find out later, the third tier also gets occupied by heroes who simply die. Normally we'd call those heroes supports, but it goes a little further than that. Mars doesn't want to have to use Arena of Blood every kill. It's got a pretty long cooldown, but if there are heroes that can be bursted all the way down just with a Spear of Mars into a tree, and then a stab stab stab, and then a finishing off God's Rebuke to end this poor hero in less than 5 seconds, then perfect. And obviously heroes that find themselves squishy enough to be shanked by Mars are usually heroes that you know, don't have high HP like Shaman and Oracle and Crystal Maiden and Witch Doctor. God's Rebuke alone allows for the countering of the squishiest of heroes, as well as, because of that creep killing cleave, Brood Mothers and Lycans and Beastmasters and Wraith King's cute little skeleton man army. Technically, because he's a king, it'd be called his regiment, but then we get into hot water with Wraith King being called the King of Skeletons, which very nicely compacts down to skeleton. And then to close off, uh, we have the Clash of the Titans. Well, Clash of a Titan versus a very, very small uh, satyr looking thing. The eternal battle between Ricky and Mars. Fitting that this would be the case after I talked so much about their similarities in an earlier segment. Ricky attacks from behind, a devastating strike that is doubly devastating due to Mars's weak spot being his behind. Uh, so I guess Ricky beats Mars. Unless you know that he beats Mars and then you can play around that. In that case, you can get attacked by Ricky and then spin around and start wailing on him mano a mano. As we touched on earlier, the counter to Ricky is to just not let him scare you. You turn around and face him, even if he drops that smoke screen. In that case, Mars beats Ricky. Except now, Ricky himself can play around that and blink away. And he can blink right out of Arena too. Ricky beats Mars again. But aha! Then you realize that to escape from Arena, Ricky has to blink onto something. He, he can't just target the ground like a Queen of Pain. He can only escape if there's something out there to let him escape. It'll usually be creeps, but we can play around that. If you're aware of that potential, we can wait to cast Arena until all of the creeps of the wave are inside the arena with Ricky. Ricky can't blink out at that point. Ricky is stuck. And in this case, Mars yet again beats Ricky. I urge you to carry on the train of counter after counter counter after counter counter counter, counter because trust me, it can go on for a while. Along with the power pyramid in the previous segment, I think we can dust off the very, very old and very, very unused ally combo pyramid. Being that Mars is a new hero without already predefined ideas for hero synergy, it makes sense to devote a bit of time to it. I, 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 imagine this segment as more teaching you all how to fish rather than, you know, giving you the fish for this one specific meal. I feel like in every aspect of these videos, the underlying ideas should be that we discuss more how to help you understand why something works the way it does, rather than simply you needing to take my word that it does work. You know what I mean? With Master's four abilities, we'll talk about the core concepts of heroes that combo with them, and then along the way I'll get really specific and point out exactly how Mars combos with a handful of heroes. But I won't tell you them all, 
it'd be impossible for me to do so. I mean, I don't know the heroes that are going to come out after Mars. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I don't know what heroes will be reworked, and I don't know what Dota will look like in a month. But by the end of this, I will know that I've given you all the tools you will need to extrapolate for yourself the perfect way to combo with anything. So let's go. With Mars being so dependent on mana, or rather so obviously suffering from a lack of mana, heroes that give him mana are pretty good. Crystal Maiden is an example, sure, I mean Frostbite also helps land Spear of Mars, but her mana is passive regen based. Uh, heroes like Keeper of the Light, who can offer instant extra mana, work wonders. Plus, we'll find both of these guys pair up shockingly well with that other spell of his. Like the cold open animated short showed, uh, Bristleback, the Bristly Backpack works pretty well too, although not in an actual useful way. <laughs> Uh, how often are you going to be able to literally hoist him onto your back and have him ride you around like a pony? What's more useful are heroes that actually give you magic resistance to pair up with your attack resistance, supports like Oracle, and heroes that buy Glimmer and Pipe of Insight. You know, stuff like that. With Spear of Mars being like it is, a target point skill shot spell that can be missed just as likely as it can be hit, uh, the same heroes that guarantee hard to land stun combos uh, combo well with Mars. A bonus point actually goes towards heroes who stun by causing a terrain barrier that Spear of Mars can connect to. Uh, heroes that allow for that include Earthshaker with his stunning fissure, Clockwork with his trapping power cogs, Tusk with his ice shards if he angles it right, and Nature's Prophet with his sprout. To add on to this, if you were a bully in high school who wants to be able to replicate that awful awful trick where your friend gets behind a victim and gets on all fours and then you push that guy Guy, so he stumbles over him and accidentally cracks open his fucking skull, causing you to be traumatized for life and regretful for the decisions that brought you to this place. Uh, you can pretty much do the exact same thing in Dota by prepping your Spear of Mars and having an ally or teammate go along and plant an Iron Branch tree to facilitate the Spear of Mars' impact, location, and stun. In fact, with Dota the way it is right now, and Iron Branch having a shockingly long cast range of 400 units, you can even do that yourself. But this is ally combos. Bringing facts like that into the segment is like going to your senior ball with your hands smeared in makeup and wearing a toy dress while everyone else actually brought, you know, actual dates. But I'm sure all of my subscribers were the coolest kids at their balls, so I wouldn't worry about that. This section is the calm before the storm, because there's not really too much that pairs up with Mars's God's Rebuke. By itself, it's basically just a physical damage AoE attack damage based nuke. Not necessarily a cleave, because like Anchor Smash, it applies all of the attack modifiers onto all of the heroes touched by it, as if an instant attack went off and individually hit every single unit simultaneously. So in this regard, ally combos that pair up nicely with him are heroes with armor reduction spells, like Vengeful Spirit and Slada. Beyond that, Rebuke is just a simple, sturdy spell that works the same no matter who's on your team. It doesn't really combo very well. And then we get to the storm. Arena of Blood. Oh boy, it might be easier to list all of the heroes that don't combo well with Mars in this ability, but for efficiency, and to let you have more of a first-hand experience coming up with more, we'll only list the big ones here. In no particular order, Arena of Blood plus uh, Dark Willow's Terrorize, the one that makes heroes run back to their ancients, pairs up amazingly well, as you'll all hopefully already be able to imagine after me just naming the spells. If you don't get it, Terrorize is one of those rare spells that causes enemies to constantly need to move, meaning that they're going to be constantly pushing themselves towards their ancient and smacking against the arena walls. Same with all of the fear abilities, really. Uh, arena of Blood plus Monkey King's Wukong's command is, I mean, that's the obvious one, right? I mean, trap everyone in a Hell in the Cell match and then bring in Terracotta reinforcements. Plus, if both get the right talents, you can end up giving Monkey King 100 armor plus 100 HP regen per second. If he's still imagining to die after that, you've got bigger problems. Heroes that push people work lovely too, I mean Huskar's inner fire throws enemies backwards much more than they really need to to be able to be hit by the wall. Uh, same with Coddle's blinding light, and in a way so does Chikiro's macropire, Invoker's chaos media, and Crystal Maiden's freezing field. You know, um, these are all area denial spells, you either get hit by them, or you knowingly and willingly move out of the way to avoid being hit by them. And I always say, pushing enemies to need to make a decision between two horrible, horrible evils is the best place to be from a winning standpoint. You are forcing people to either tank Macropire or tank Arena of Blood hits. And because nobody actually knows the exact amount of damage that Arena of Blood does, because it's not really ingrained in people's subconscious, uh, you can sort of get away with confusing them and making them question if Macropire's thousands of damage is more than or less than Arena of Blood's potential damage. Spoiler alert, it's going to usually be more. Arena of Blood doesn't necessarily do too much damage, but that's that's the joy of it. People don't know that yet. In fact, maybe I shouldn't have even told you because now you know and the strategy works less. Uh, so uh, I guess don't share this, shit, I can't say don't share the video. Uh, I think I've just put myself into a lose-lose situation myself. 
If you do it right, or if the enemy is horribly unlucky, you might end up being able to do both at the same time, with that enemy desperately trying to get out of Macropire and running himself into the wall, only to be bounced right back into Macropire again. And in that same vein, heroes like Disruptor, Conquer, and in a really fun way, Lich can do the same. I love Lich in Arena. Delta Split is mathematically impossible to do considering Chain Frost's bounce range is, I believe, 600, and an Arena of Blood's borders are 550. But my favorite technique is to do the Phoenix Supernova plus Defensive Arena of Blood strat. Phoenix casts their ult, and right before those enemies attack that one last hit that blows it up, you throw down your arena so the egg's inside, and the enemies are outside, and you've all but guaranteed the egg will go off. My favorite strats are the ones you will only ever see once but you will definitely remember them. I haven't seen this done yet, but I'm looking forward to it. As we move forward, we'll probably find ourselves speeding up due to how much preliminary knowledge has been spent just trying to explain what Mars does enough to give examples. Without actually getting to talk about what his spells do yet, we already kind of know so much, right? His W is a cleave type thing, his R is an area denial spell. With that in mind, let's actually finally talk about his spells and explain what they actually do. Here's a typical mid build for Mars. We'll elaborate on the offlane and support alternatives in a bit after we get the baseline. You'll notice right off the bat that we get a value point in God's Rebuke of all things, but then we don't max it until level. 11. Uh, Spear of Mars is maxed by level 7, which is the you know normal place to max a spell. Bulwark gets a value point and the rest is self-explanatory. Uh, alt when possible, just like always, and talents when possible, just like always. What I want to touch on is that God's Rebuke is picked up at level 1 because of its ability to last hit creeps. It's so good at last hitting creeps that it actually makes sense to max the dang thing. It's spammable, and getting more levels makes it more spammable. It's physical damage, it's a lot of damage, it's an AoE, so every single time you hit it, you can use it to get a creep kill, and you can also use it to clip a hero and wear him down in the exact same hit. But we don't max it. We, we don't do that. We instead get Spear. And here's why. You don't have the mana necessary to level up God's Rebuke and also continue to spam it. Remember earlier when we talked about how much it fucking costs? Especially with the last patch making it cost 10 more every level. Living it at level 1 for last hits is best. The caveat to this is if you think you can pretty much get an early bottle and then guarantee you will fill it every single 2 minutes and then be able to pick up an early soul ring and then that you can guarantee that you won't get your mana burnt by the enemy mid laner or any sort of ganker, although I can't really think of too many gankers with mana burn abilities. Maybe Lion. Well, it's here anyway for posterity, right? Other requirements, because of course we're not done yet, include having the enemy hero be a melee or short range hero that you'll be able to clip with every single cast of God's Rebuke, and having that same enemy not be an easily escaping hero. Like, your Marana's in Queen of Pains. Except Marana and Queen of Pain is a terrible example because obviously those guys are 600 range ranged heroes that uh, sort of dodge God's Rebuke. See, you can see the dilemma that we're in right now, right? Because are there heroes that this works against? The answer is obviously yes, but um, when going mid, you might not find them too often. And that's why, by default, I suggest the alternative build that we had listed. Keep in mind, we're substituting our ever-increasing Disable with this alternative to the original build here. The opportunity cost of having God's Rebuke as a spammable main source of damage means that you lose out on knockback, on stuns, on repositioning capabilities, and on your wombo combo for Arena of Blood. Without getting any levels of Spear, by level 6 we might not actually have the capabilities to kill anyone in Arena, because Spear of Mars can't pin them to the Arena long enough. So you have to ask yourself, is what we're doing worth it? One more thing that I'd like to add to the general concept of mid Mars's levels is that God's Rebuke deals a very specific amount of damage. I mean obviously, most spells do, right? Sorry. The formula for success when it comes to outlast hitting your opponent is obviously having more damage than he does. The perfect place to be is the zone beyond having double the amount of damage he does. In terms of last hitting, we can imagine a 50 damage hero up against a 51 damage hero. If a creep hit takes another creep down from say 55 to 45, either of those heroes will get it, ignoring armor in the simplified scenario. The window of opportunity for the higher damage hero to benefit where the other hero can't is a measly 1 HP point. That's, I mean, it's, it's just not going to happen. If a creep gets down to 51, one hero can get it and the other can't. And here's the crux. If you have double the damage of the enemy hero, your zone is shockingly better. A creep gets down to 100 HP and you kill it. A creep gets down to 80 HP and you kill it. A creep gets down to 51 HP and you kill it. Every single one of those HP examples is an example in which you succeed where the enemy mid laner doesn't. The great thing about this is that the counter to it is either the other hero buying more damage, which may mess up his item progression because he doesn't really want to get more early game prowess, maybe he wanted to rush a blink, or simply resorting to attacking twice for every single last hit. If he sees you rocking up to deny his last hit, 
he would have to fire on it to get it from 100 to 50, and then fire on it again. There was absolutely no hero in the entire game who was faster than a second when it comes to attacking and then attacking again. You have a giant window in which to realize what he's doing and then put an end to it. And for this reason, I can see you getting more levels in God's Rebuke. Not even actually more levels, just one more to get to level 2. We can work out that by default level 1 we deal 58 to 66 damage without any items, so an average of 62. Uh, God's Rebuke deals 160% of that at level 1. Uh, you will be dealing, uh, I think, 99.2 damage when using God's Rebuke. 99.2 is plenty. Um, not many heroes can deal 99.2 damage at level 1, uh, but it isn't the highest amount that we can have. By level 6, there are plenty of heroes who can overtake you. Uh, Shadowfin being one that you'll run into a lot, but there's also Tiny, Earthshaker with Enchant Totem, uh, Exhort Invoker, TA. You're not godly yet. Basically what it boils down to is this. Does the second level of God's Rebuke keep you afloat on the sea of constant one-upmanship? Level 2 God's Rebuke takes you from 99.2 damage to 130. If this gets you back up to double your enemy mid laner's damage, then by all means, go for it. But in the next segment, we'll talk about what to do as an offlaner and a support. And we'll also finally touch on what the fuck his spells actually do. In hindsight, maybe we should have done that section first. Remember when Slada used to get bullied by all of the other heroes for having absolutely no creative flair when it came to naming his abilities? Hey Slada, why did you call your sprint? I called it sprint! Oh yeah, I guess that makes sense. Hey Slada, why did you call your passive bash ability? I called it bash! Oh yeah, in retrospect that was probably a silly question. Hey Slada, what was that spell that helped you lower an enemy's armor and give true sight thereby basically amplifying all damage that we would then deal to him? What was that called? You know, I have no idea. I seem to have forgotten. But then Slada blew up. He's Jack. And with that change comes a new outlook on life and new names for his abilities. His ult's now called Corrosive Haze. His sprint's called Guardian Spirit. He looks good. Now the only people that get screwed over by all of this are those Dota quiz makers that show an icon and the name of an ability for you to have to name the hero that it came from. Bash of the Deep? What sort of hero has an ability like that? Oh, I don't know. Man, this quiz sucks. But now I guess the comments that have made these new abilities pretty freaking obvious. Hmm, Spear of Mars. What hero has the ability Spear of Mars? <laughs> Boy, man, that is a stumper. But while we're on the subject, let's talk about Spear of Mars. Spear of Mars is a spear of Mars. It's a target point spell, so essentially a skill shot. It doesn't track units. It's like a meat hook. Upon cast, you hear a spear, which technically makes it now a javelin, but we won't get into that. And then that spear travels in a straight line at 1400 units per second until it reaches its max distance of 900 to 1200 depending on the level, whereupon it fizzles out of existence. Either that, or it hits a bunch of enemies and deals from 100 to 325 damage on a 14 second cooldown. So, uh, cool. It's a good nuke. Works on creeps as well as heroes. Uh, this will be useful for farming. Except if Spear of Mars only did that, it would be a great item. But Spear of Mars also hits one enemy hero, and then that enemy hero is skewered and thrown backwards. If that hero kebab hits a tree, or a tower, or a building, or a cliff, or any form of obstacle before the spear fizzles out, that enemy hero gets stunned for up to 2.8 or 3.8 seconds with the talent. It's not like Magnus' skewer, it doesn't pin more than one hero, but it will only ever pin heroes, not creeps. The first enemy hero caught by it will then be impaled and pulled back by it. That's all pretty obvious information, but did you also know that Arena of Blood pairs up pretty nicely with Spear of Mars? Oh you did. Oh yes, I guess that's the most obvious and clearly visible interaction of all of Mars's kit. Jeez, I'm just trying to help, you know? Here are some things that you might not know. Spear of Mars will only ever drag one hero. If a hero gets saved from the spear, or you know, straight up dies before the spear ends, the now empty spear still will not pick up a new hero to take on its wild ride. But that isn't to say Spear of Mars doesn't do anything to heroes beyond the first one. As well as damaging them, Spear also deals the slightest of side knockbacks. Knock sides? Anyway, throwing a spear on a hero will cause that spear plus hero combo to push every other unit to the side in an uncancelling knockback. It won't break channels and it won't cancel TPs, but it will let you have more opportunities to benefit from Arena of Blood. But we're not there yet. Spear of Mars gives true side to us for the enemy that ends up getting skewered to a tree, but only at that point. While it completely works on invis units and units in the fog and all that, it won't actually reveal invis units until the spear has stopped traveling. If it makes it to a tree with that hero in tow, it'll at the very end, grant you true sight. What it does give you before that is 300 flying vision around that spear. The vision remains for one second after the spear finally dies, and when impaling a hero, the vision stays the entire time that that hero is stunned. After the stun, all trees within a 100 radius get destroyed, so no cheeky strat where you throw an enemy into a clearing in the jungle and then close the opening with a bunch of iron branch trees. Spear of Mars will not let you grief people. 
but you are free to prove me wrong. Spear of Mars stuns immediately after it makes contact, and then once you hit a tree, it'll stun again. This might seem like an odd thing to bring up, but it could be the difference between stopping a TP and not stopping a TP. With Spear traveling at a speed of 1400 units per second, anything that beats that speed can be used to make that Spear hit sooner. For instance, you see an enemy hero teleporting out, he's got 1.25 seconds left on his TP, you're 1425 range away, which is Spear of Mars's max distance of 1200 at level 4, plus 125 extra to account for Spear of Mars's collision size. Spear of Mars takes 0.25 seconds to cast. Oh my god, you're not going to make it. In 1.25 seconds, you'll have thrown the spear just shy of reaching him as he disappears into the ether. And the place he is TPing to is an orphaned puppy sanctuary. He's going to kill them all. And he does. Because you couldn't stop him. You spend the next 10 years slowly alienating yourself from your friends and your family, drinking more and more often and waking up in a cold sweat to the sounds of whimpering puppies in your nightmares. And they're not just normal puppy whimpers, they're specifically orphaned puppy whimpers, which you can tell somehow. They sound exactly the same, but with an undertone of horrible, horrible sadness. And you couldn't save them. Basically, your depressing downward spiral continues for the rest of your short life, until you inevitably die by embarrassingly, embarrassingly, drunkenly spilling liquor all over yourself in your pitch black bathroom because you couldn't afford to pay the electric bill, which causes you to assess the spillage by sparking up your lighter, which causes your alcohol soaked clothes to go up in flames, which causes you to panic and try to fling your clothes off and throw them in the shower, which causes the flame to spread to your pants, which causes you to need to whip them off too. But while you're hopping around trying to remove them, you slip on the alcohol that spilled on the tile floor, which causes you to slam head first into your toilet's tank. You flop into the bowl, your head gets submerged in the overflowing toilet water because you lost the plunger, and your head gets lodged in there, whereupon you drown in naught but your undies, smelling of booze, completely alone, with no one to care enough about you, but your landlord weeks down the line after complaints of a horrible, horrible smell coming from your apartment. Ah. But wouldn't the fire at least spare you from the post-mortem embarrassment of this disastrous event? No, because in your flailing, you splashed the tiniest amount of toilet water onto the fire, extinguishing it just in time. And in your final seconds, all you can hear are the sounds of orphan puppies. But that is, of course, what will happen if you miss your Spear of Mars. So just blink right up to the guy and cast a point blank range to mitigate absolutely any travel time you may need. Because of the disabling force movement, you can instantly cast that guy's TP and then go on to live a very, very happy and fulfilling life until you, ironically, get hit by an ambulance. Moving on. God's rebuke is some sort of religious joke or something, right? I mean, I mean, Valve knows what a rebuke is, right? A rebuke's like a really, really harsh verbal scolding for someone who's done wrong. I mean, I wouldn't classify bashing someone's shit in with the butt of a shield to be a, a very positive form of rebuke. I mean, that's ultra-violent. That's, that's crazy. It's on the level of drowning an entire civilization, or turning a husband's wife into salt, or cursing a young man to eternally push an immense boulder up a big hill. Although that'd be a good workout for your calves. It's on the level of chaining the guy who gave fire to mankind and commanding an eagle to peck at his liver for all of eternity. Oh wait, no. That's not Mars. That's Zeus. Yeah, on second thought, God's Rebuke is a pretty fitting name for the beatdown that is W incurs. In fact, comparatively, it's pretty tame. God's Cleave is yet another target point spell, meaning that it can be aimed, more on that soon. Upon activation, it deals a flurry of instant attacks to every single enemy unit of from 160% damage to 280% damage, and then 360% damage with a talent, while also knocking back all affected by about 150 units. A flat damage bonus of 25 is added to all heroes hit by it, and it deals this damage in a giant 500 radius, with a spread of 70 degrees on both sides of Mars, effectively 140 degrees all up. It basically forms a slice of a pie chart, a pie chart detailing all of the people who are very much dead in a circle of all other people. I mean, to be fair, I've already proven that I don't know what Venn diagrams are. The instant attack means that every single attack modifier you have works on these affected units. While resembling exactly a cleave, even the shape of a cleave, it is not a cleave. It does not cleave. It attacks everyone individually at the same time. Furthermore, all of those attacks have true strike, meaning that they can't miss and because of it being a spell, all of those instant attacks go through disarms. In fact, God's Rebuke can proc each and every single attack modifier in the game. Desolator, all three types of lifesteal items, Scardi, all of it. Ironically, the only one it doesn't proc is Cleave. But I'll leave it to you as to why they'd want to deliberately leave that one out. 
Imagine what could happen if it was still in there. Because of this spell alone, Mars has a whole world of possibility given to him as a utility hero. God's Rebuke also always crits, meaning that it actually stacks additively with the chance of all other crits. Not to say that you would actually get a crit on Mars because of that, but food for thought. Crits work in such a way that the highest value will always go first. So with Daedalus having only 235 or so crits, uh, God's Rebuke will always proc instead. This kind of proves that Daedalus shouldn't ever be picked up. God's Rebuke being target pointed means that it's not actually an instant thing. It's not like Anchor Smash smashing all around you on cast. You have to activate the ability and then click somewhere on the ground to cast it. Unless of course you have a quick cast, but then you're too cool for us if you do that. Because of God's Rebuke's angle of influence being very, very static, you can actually use this in a really smart way to make sure you're only ever killing the creep you're wanting to whilst not damaging the rest and pushing your wave. This only really matters in the laning phase, obviously. In all that I've said on Mars, so far this one point may seem like the lamest, but this honestly is probably single-handedly the thing that'll help you win a game. Know this. Uh, please. But then there's one more trick. And calling it a trick is generous, because in actuality it is a bug. If you were to use Spare of Mars, throwing that spare at a person in melee range would then definitely hit a tree, and then you were to use God's Rebuke immediately after that, you would basically break the game. Spare of Mars is a knockback, God's Rebuke is too. God's Rebuke's knockback moves an enemy 150 units, Spare of Mars does much more. But Dota doesn't like that. Dota does not work like that. If you were to clip God's Rebuke on someone flying through the air with a spear, you would interrupt that spear traveling, instantly freeze that hero in place, and then also still benefit from the stun that Spare of Mars would have also gotten had you not interrupted it. That's pretty fucking confusing, so let me reword that. If you toss the hero back, and then quickly hit him with a rebuke, that hero will not travel with the spear. He will freeze in place, but to the game, he is traveling with that spear. He's just not moving. So if the spear still hits a tree, he will be stunned. In fact, if that hero was heading for a tree, and the now empty spear still hits that tree, the hero will still be stunned, but left right next to Mars. This is endlessly useful. If you need to stun a guy, but the only tree is down a cliff or something, uh, being that throwing spears down a cliff won't actually stun them like it would up a cliff, your stunning him would actually cause him to end up in a lower elevation than you, with you unable to go down the cliff after him to go down and get him. This is a very common thing in the Radiant and Dire High Grounds, as there are trees around the border, but tossing a hero down there means you'll have to run outside of your base, which is, you know, safety, and then down the stairs to continue messing with them. If you did this bug, you would be able to benefit from the stun you'd get, while also guaranteeing that you don't push the hero far back enough away that you you know, can't catch back up to him. Now watch this be patched out within seconds of this video going up, because if it doesn't, anyone playing against Mars is in for a world of hurt. Enjoy! Bulwark's a pretty good spell. It's like Bristleback's Bristleback. But that's probably obvious. With it having such a short description in game, it stands to reason that we probably wouldn't really have much to say about it out of game too. Uh, basically, attacks coming from the front, 140 degrees around Mars, deal up to 70% less damage. All right, okay, that's good so far. And then attacks 50 degrees beyond that on each side are blocked by a slightly downgraded amount of 35%. You'll notice right away that Bulwark's front angle is the exact same shape as God's Rebuke's cleave. Well, I mean, you know, cleave for want of a better word. So as you get more and more used to Rebuke, you will automatically get better with understanding the limits of Bulwark. Okay, that's handy stuff. Bulwark reduces damage from attacks no matter what damage type they end up doing. It does not block physical damage. That's not what it does. Sure, there's a Venn diagram that has physical damage overlapping pretty heavily, but that's incidental. Bulwark is not coded to block physical damage. Bulwark does not block physical damage simply because it's physical. Bulwark blocks most physical damage because most physical damage comes in the way of physical attacks. Bulwark doesn't block Quill Spray or Omni Slash or Tidebringer or any of the other dozens of spells in the games that happen to do physical damage through spell-based means. But on the flip side of that, Bulwark does block attacks that do any other type of damage. It blocks TA's pure side blades, it blocks Javelin, it blocks Sniper's Headshot, it blocks Chilling Touch, Storm Spritz Overload, all of it. Essentially, regardless of all of that, if Mars ends up taking only attack-based damage, and all of it from the front, his effective HP rises to 233% of his regular amount. 233% of his regular amount. But the most fun part about this otherwise admittedly pretty boring spell is that Bulwark procs on impact. Which means that you can predict hits coming your way. Which means that you can very easily turn to face a projectile, 
stand your ground, tank it with Bulwark, and then turn back around to go back to what you were doing. This is effortlessly fun when playing off lane and taking harassed damage from a sport who's ended up right behind you. Every single attack, just swing around and strike and pose, and then go back to last setting with nary a point of HP missing. But now we're on to the big one. Arena of Blood is a perfect spell. It's the type of spell that makes every other spell better. Its addition to the game has made the entire game better. That's a pretty bold claim, right? It's as if every single hero in the game has been buffed by Mars's presence. Because, famously, Arena of Blood, after 0.1 seconds of cast point and 0.6 seconds of effect delay, erects a giant 550 radius Colosseum of Death, bordered by 14 gladiatorial guards, all of whom have a burning hatred for anyone trying to get past them. They're like the US Border Patrol, if the US Border Patrol all had giant spares and the ability to shoot fire. It's probably a good thing that they don't. For 5 seconds at level 1, and 7 seconds at level 3, Arena of Blood encircles a target area and traps any enemy inside, including creeps. Any hero trying to escape will get pushed back and dealt up to 250 damage by them guards, as well as being pushed back 160 units. The knockback is actually for the enemy's benefit, because if he wasn't pushed outside of the 160 trigger distance of the next one, after 1 second of rest, another spare shank will come from that guard to deal another 250 damage. All up, it is possible to have Arena of Blood deal 1,750 from one guard alone. And there are 14 of them. But it gets better. Or I guess worse, depending on your point of view. Because of Spare of Mars and God's Rebuke's innate knockback abilities, it is entirely possible to pinball an enemy in perpetuity. Counters to this include if the enemy can fly. If he can fly, he can just yeet on out of there with nary a random inspection. And it's not even just flying. I think it's if any hero manages to get over one unit off the ground on the Y-axis, Arena of Blood can't stop you. Why would there be a height axis in a game that's entirely lateral, you ask? Well, turns out, uh, the Source engine used to be made for these 3D games called Shooters. Confusing name, I know. But turns out, Valve were quite famous for them. The Source engine had axes in all three directions, height, width, and depth, and Source 2 maintained parity. But because of this, any unit that has a spell that elevates them can escape from the arena. It's not coded very well. Uh, Tiny with his toss, Kunkka with his torrent, if another enemy of course then pushed him at the zenith of his upwards journey. That same system works for Nyx with Impale and, and Lion and Invoker's Tornado. Rubik's Telekinesis can accidentally free someone. Turns out it's really, really easy to get out of Arena of Blood. But that's where it gets interesting. Other counters include BKBs and Blinks, although having 3 seconds with which to refresh Blinks cooldown is quite the ask while inside the Arena of Death. But as mentioned with Ricky, while some Blinks can be cast at any point at any time, given the hero doing so has the mana for it, some other Blinks are conditional. And because the spells exist in such a way that conditions have to be met, we, as Mars, can simply set up a scenario in which it's impossible for that to happen. While well, anti-mage and quops blinks are only really counted by locking them down the entire time with like rods of adices and maybe silences, other blinks need a bit more to work with. The one you'll run into the most is a blink requiring an enemy or allied unit target. Like with the aforementioned Ricky's Blink Strike, but also with Phantom Assassin's Phantom Strike and Spirit Breaker's Nether Strike. I guess all spells with Strike in their name work for this, so that's handy. Keep that in mind, everyone. Officially, that's the system. Uh, okay, moving on, we then have spells that are ground targeted, like Sand King's Burrow's Stri- Oh. Well, that was short lived. I guess I was wrong about that. Okay. Regardless, use the requirements for successful blinks to your advantage, and you'll never find yourself in trouble. Beyond that, Arena of Blood has that one second delay before attacking again, which means you, you know, shouldn't use your Q and W at the same time. Pushing a stunned unit back too soon causes them to be able to recover and move out of the way before the guards refresh and attempt to shank them again. Arena also provides flying vision inside its walls for the entirety of the duration, meaning that if you really wanted to, you could use it to check up cliffs for wards granted you have the true sight. But the thing has a cooldown of from 90 to 60 seconds and a mana cost of fucking 200, so I wouldn't recommend it. Obviously, if you have Arena of Blood within a bunch of trees so that those trees are in the arena, your Spare of Mars won't actually push enemies into the damage dealing wall like you'd like, you know, they just fling them into the trees. But beyond all of this, we've only touched on half of the spell. We've talked all about what happens on the inside of these walls. But then, what happens to the outside? If you imagine Arena of Blood like Disruptor's Kinetic Field plus Arc Warden's Magnetic Field on steroids, you're pretty much in business. In fact, to remember it better, you can try combining both of the names and ending up with Kinetic Field. Oh, um, never mind. Essentially, anyone on the outside is blocked from coming inside by an ever-increasing slow that gets exponentially stronger the closer you get to the walls. If you turn away, uh, the slow gets cancelled, but obviously you can't moonwalk into the arena, so, you know, it's good enough. 
That's the kinetic field part. The magnetic field on steroids part is that all attack damage from all enemy heroes on all sides drops to absolutely nothing. An attack projectile coming from outside targeting a unit inside does nothing. Not it misses, not it deals no damage, it does nothing. It doesn't hit at all. And there is absolutely no counter to it. BKB does not mitigate it. MKB and True Strike doesn't. The only way for you to deal attack damage to someone inside that arena is to be inside that arena. Well, either that or literally just being a melee hero with no projectile needed. That also kind of works. Turns out if Mars is close enough to the rim, you can sort of just lean in and whack him with a stick and he'll die. Kind of wish I didn't know that. Uh, kind of makes Arena of Blood less cool. To compensate for that, check out this. You can use Arena of Blood in a multitude of different and unique ways. My current favorite, which I've seen done once in the over month that he's been in the game, uh, keeping in mind that he's in every single game in this patch, is to put it on the low ground while you're on the high ground and the enemy is on the low ground to cause the push when the enemy hits the walls to volley him up and over the cliff to the high ground. Isn't that next level? The place I saw this happen was on the high ground for Radiant Space, on a poor position 3 Earthshaker who offered to take the risk of placing a high ground ward away from his defenseless support. He paid for that generosity, and I bet he'll never do it again. In practice, I have proof that it works there, but in theory, you can use it in the river also, and in the jungle, and even, because we're horrible, horrible, horrible people, right on the opposite side of one of those beacony jungle ward spots. Icefrog thought ahead. He blocked us from being able to use Spare of Mars to trap people up there. Obviously, when Spare of Mars hits a cliff, it freezes, so it's impossible to move them up a cliff. But he didn't think far enough ahead. He underestimated the power of embarrassingly inquisitive fans looking to exploit any single bug that they can find. And we found one. A tip is that you can use Arena of Blood defensively when up against heroes with a billion burst spells, but nothing to cancel a TP or something. If you're being attacked by, like, anything ranged, you can pop up an Arena of Blood right there so you're casting it right on the border, with the enemy attacking you staying out. It's imperative that you do this exactly. You can be anywhere you'd like as long as the enemy is outside. If the enemy is outside, he has no way of getting back inside without a blink or other form of instant travel movement. But if he's inside, you have no way of pushing him out. We're using this defensively. We're using this to escape. In this hypothetical, we can't kill him. Unlikely, I know, but bear with me, this is a made-up scenario. It is totally possible to erect an arena of blood and TP inside of it. While stuns can obviously still go through the arena walls, normal attacks can't. With this strategy, you can pull off clutch TP escapes in a way that no other hero can. And it gets even better. Because against a subset of those heroes, namely the heroes that have no damage outside of their physical attacks, you can even buy the 3 seconds needed for you to get Blink Dagger off of cooldown and peace on out of there. Also, if you are wanting to make sure you hit your Spear of Mars on an enemy inside of Arena of Blood, um, you can step out of it. As touched on in the How to Play Against Mars section earlier, an enemy's best bet is to try and get himself as close to you as possible. Uh, that's not really possible when you're outside of the arena. Keep in mind, you can leave and enter the arena as many times as you want. You can also use Master Spear at the very end to extend your stun. Use it earlier to maximize your damage. And finally, if you were to stand in the exact middle of Arena of Blood with your 250 range, you would never not be able to hit an enemy inside the borders. What the fuck, right? What is it with Ice Frog and Heroes with big sticks? Not implying anything, of course. Before moving away from skills and finally getting to items, let's quickly take a moment to talk about talents. The sort of midway point between them. They're not technically skills, but they're... I mean, you don't buy them. They give a few bonuses that would be equivalent to items, but... Yeah, I mean, it's talents. You already know what talents are. Unfortunately for us, Mars's talents are a bit of a snooze fest. We used to have things to talk about, but now it's pretty standard. 721D nerfed his level 20 spear stun duration talent, and now it's pretty much just a choice between two pretty okay choices. You can easily win with any order of talents here, but just to help you along, let's talk about each. At level 10, we start off with plus 8 strength versus plus 20 movement speed. Uh, for clarity, plus 8 strength is 160 health, 0.8 regen, and 0. 6-4 magic resistance, I think. And of course, you know, 8 attack damage because he's a strength hero. Keep in mind, just passively, uh, Mars gains 3.2 strength with every level that he gets. So plus 8 strength really isn't much in the grand scheme of things, especially as a percentage when compared to his total strength. I mean, imagine this. If Mars at level 10 had 5 HP total, then yes, I would beg you to get <laughs> plus 8 strength. It would be 160 onto 5. That's, I think, a 3200% increase in health. 
as it stands right now with Mars having at the very least 1220 at level 10 uh, he's only gaining 13% of an increase maybe it's not really worth it compare that to plus 20 raw movement speed and all of a sudden you've got more going for you right it lets you reposition to catch the angle for a successful Spear of Mars cast. It lets you run down enemies for Arena of Blood if you don't have Blink available. And it lets you get from camp to camp faster in order to swing your God's Rebuke and get showered in gold. I think I've revealed my hand a bit early here, but in case you didn't pick up on it, I'd, I'd say plus 20 movement speed every single time. At level 15 it's even more clearer. Dota says that between plus 8 armor and plus 35 extra damage, uh, choosing the extra damage causes you to be 4.7% more likely to win a game than the alternative. And a game so balanced around that 50% chance mark, a deviation of over 4% is extraordinary. It makes sense too, while armor is pretty good, you've already got a pretty good amount of armor innately, plus your high HP, plus the way the bulwark works. Uh, bulwark blocks damage only after all other calculations. If you've got 100 damage and Mars has zero armor, you deal 100 damage, which turns into 30 damage because of bulwark. Now let's say you've got 10 armor. 100 damage mitigated by 10 armor means you will deal about 70, which in turn turns into 21 damage. You'll notice that with 10 armor, all we've really managed to do is block nine points of damage. But so then instead you take the plus 35 attack damage rather than the plus eight armor, and you try to see all of the many, many ways that that could be useful. Because of that, I get to pull out my classic line. You can't kill the ancient by smacking it with armor. I've literally never said that before, but I've meant it most of the time. What that basically translates to is this idea that when it all comes down to it, the one stat that ends the game is attack damage. And like a pebble on a still lake, that idea ripples and permeates outwards to cause major waves. If you start off the game with more damage, you guarantee more last hits, meaning more money, meaning items faster, meaning more freedom to farm, meaning more money, meaning more items, meaning more damage, meaning on and on and on until you win the game. Plus 35 damage at level 15 is a bit too late to really help him farm too much. You'll already be in the mid game with Blink and maybe a few other items before that point, but it does allow for you to boost the rest of your farm forevermore. God's Rebuke's damage is directly tied to your attack damage, as is, well, all of your attacks. Arena of Blood will have you whacking away at people pretty much the whole duration, so a plus 35 damage increase pays off. Suffice to say, at level 15, you might want to get damage. At level 20, it's a toss-up between plus 1 second spear stun and plus 200 damage on that spear. It used to be a 1.5 second increase on spear stun, but that was a bit ludicrous, right? With 1.5 extra, you could reliably get a 4.3, a 4.3 second stun on a 14 second cooldown. Even for a level 20 talent, that's a bit much. They then brought it down to 1 second, and yet it's still broken. I would still get spear stun. The utility of a disable in the long run will mean much, much more than you than an extra plus 200 damage, even if it helps you kill creeps and heroes faster. Because with the plus 35 damage from the talent before, with only Desolator, you can reliably, reliably one shot a creep wave with just God's Rebuke, leaving your spear, which is now um, increased to plus 200 damage, uh, leaving that spear to only ever be needed to stun heroes, which means that the damage is useless anyway. Um, so I guess go stun some heroes. And then at level 25, if you've followed my path, you'll probably come to the conclusion that God's Rebuke having a plus 360% true striking crit might be pretty good. Phantom Assassin's level three ultimate crit, Coup de Gras, has a 450% crit, and that's technically only on one person. Mars's one is in an AoE. The alternative to that is Arena of Blood offering 100 HP while inside it. But um, you see, if you're in Arena of Blood, and on Mars's team, you're probably not the one who needs 100 extra HP per second to survive. I bet you can imagine why. But finally, items. The cornerstone of any only way to play guide. Shockingly, I don't ever suggest Meteor Hammer, Solar Crest, and Echo Saber in this guide. But maybe I could. I mean, I mean hmm. Meteor Hammer is perfectly landable when a spare of Mars stun is 2.8 seconds. Hmm. It gives mana and pushing power. That's something Mars needs. Hmm. No. No. Fight it, Eric. Don't listen to me. If I tell you to get a Meteor Hammer, it's a lie. It's a horrible curse that was put on me. I can't stop recommending it, regardless of context. What I will happily recommend is this. Begin the game as we all do, with a, with, with a giant shield. Wait, what? Don't we, you know, have this massive fuck-off shield in our left hand already anyway? Ah oh, well, yeah, no matter the lane, pick up a stout shield. The way it works in conjunction with Bulwark uh, pretty much means that you take no damage. As I said earlier, Bulwark uh, calculates last 
after every other form of reduction takes place. I think that's right. I think it goes in order. Spell-based damage reductions in amps, like Skyrath's seal. Uh, then it goes armor. Then it goes damage reduction via items. Then it goes damage reduction via spells. And in that section there, it finally does bulwark. This works out in such a way that damage being dealt to you gets mitigated by your armor, and then a static amount via stealth shield if it procs. If it does proc, it lowers the amount by 20, and then simply a percentage of the remaining gets blocked by bulwark. To save time, let's make the bold claim that it's literally zero damage, stealth shield is best. For offlane, uh, two sets of tangos and a shitload of mangos would work out pretty well, along with a ward if your teammates are feeling generous enough. Uh, the ward isn't as necessary as it would be for other offlaners, so don't buy it for yourself and then take that ability for vision away from your other teammates who might absolutely need it more. It's more of a luxury. For a mid build, you're probably fine with just shield, plus a few shared tangos if you ask nicely. In fact, in some really specific scenarios, you might even be best not getting the shield at all. I mean, what is a shield but an admission of defeat? Plus, we've only got two arms. And one of them is already wielding a way cooler shield. This one's got thunderbolts on it. If you don't think you'll need a stealth shield, you can forego it in order to get a soul ring as fast as possible. That goes for offlane too. It even goes for support Mars. Every single build Mars will ever go should be built upon a soul ring rush. One of the first things we ever talked about was the fact that Mars literally does not have the mana innately to cast all of his spells at level 7. Soul ring is a core item. Also as mentioned, uh, you can buy iron branches for the express purpose of not actually using them to bolster up your stats, but specifically to plant trees behind a target to then spare them into it. Much like in the way that that spear of Mars plus God's Rebuke combo bug allowed for the ability to guarantee a stun without guaranteeing them flying 1200 units backwards back to the safety of their tower, a GG tree planted can enable you to dictate where and when an enemy is stunned. I mean, think about it, right? While it's totally possible to get behind someone and push them backwards to your tower, which we'll talk about in a bit, it's much easier to simply have the wall that that spear needs to come to you. Imagine you're last hitting under tower and your opponent's smart enough to know that you're coming. He's intelligent. He's good looking. He's probably watched this guy. That's how smart he comes across as. The second you try to get an angle on him, trying to get behind him, he'll just bail and retreat a couple of steps. You won't ever get behind him and push him back to your tower because he's aware of you trying to do that. But if he's under tower, last hitting, enjoying having his creeps tank for him, you can wait until all of the creeps are nearly dead, and he's about to run out of tower range again, and then spring the GG branch into spare on him. He'll be trapped under your tower, stunned, damaged, and in a position where that tower can take about 80% of his health off of him. They hit pretty hard in the early game, don't they? Beyond that, there's also boots. If we didn't really have to rush soul ring so bad, Mars is also the sort of hero that could justify a boots first rush. It's kind of fun how useful it is. With boots, you can get behind an enemy to push them back. Your turn rate has already been mentioned to be above average, and depending on the enemy you're up against, they may not even get boots until the 15 minute mark. If you are 50 points faster than him, you can flank him. You can run past him as they run away and push them right into your tower, which, might I remind you, counts as a type of map obstacle that causes a stun. The other trick that Boots does is that they give you more leeway in trying to escape while also doing that thing where you turn to face any attack damage coming your way. If you're running away without Boots, and the enemy chasing you also doesn't have Boots, every single time you stop moving to turn back and tank the attack projectile, the more ground you lose. In some cases, the fact that you turned around means that the enemy gets more opportunities to throw auto attacks your way. In essence, you're enabling yourself to take as much as, or even more damage than you would have normally taken just by running in a straight line. But that changes with boots. With enough surplus speed on your enemy, you can both escape and tank hits enough to reduce the amount of damage you would have normally taken. Suffice to say, soldering and boots rush is the most important thing you will do. We'll close this thing out by talking about what you should build your boots of speed into, as well as every other item and every other miscellaneous trick I know, in the final segments. See you soon. See? I told you see you soon. I, I mean, I meant it. Going from beyond starting items in early game, the mid game and late game items that you will definitely want all stem from your purpose in the game. Uh, when it comes to boots, there are two options. The first scenario is one in which you are a poorer offlaner or a position 4 or 5 support. Maybe your offlane didn't go too well and you've fallen behind. So behind that you don't actually think you have enough farm to be able to actually be a tanky frontlining initiator who can take a few jabs to the jaw like you first thought you could. I get it, it happens. Have you ever been in a game where you absolutely destroy an axe in lane, so much so that he gets a blink dagger in vanguard at 30 minutes into a game? Ah, but being a dota player, the idea of change is spooky and scary to him, so he doesn't even deviate at all from the typical build. Even though he is miles behind everyone else, and 1 in 12, he still thinks it's wise to build as an initiator. He blinks into an army of 5 decked out hard carries, because of course one of the teams would have 5 hard carries. And even though we cast Berserker's Call, they deal so much damage and have so much health that they just kill him anyway. 
he gets off uh, two counter helix procs because they end up killing him in six hits. That could be your fate if you're not careful. You could be that axe. You know the sort of axe that I'm talking about. You've seen him in games, right? But the fact that you acknowledge that means that you can change your build. As a support or an underfarmed offlaner, you transition into a sort of utility aura build and get arcane boots into greaves. And you know what? You win the game, because in dire circumstances, arcane boots and greaves are actually really useful. You don't need to tank the HP loss to cast soul ring because you've got a deeper mana pool. You can sell your soul ring. You don't die immediately because the opportunity cost for arcanes into greaves was actually a blink, and not getting a blink while you're underleveled compared to the people you could have been blinking on ends up being a good thing for your health. Greaves, as an aura, keeps your team healthy, keeps you at full mana, and gives an awesome armor aura. If you really wanted to, you can go Greaves and have a wonderful, wonderful game. But to the rest of you, you want me to talk about Phase. Phase boots are a shockingly good item on Mars. Scarily good. Suspiciously good, I might go so far as to say. You know how I said that Dota is balanced on knife edge and that and that 4% deviation away from that 50-50 chance of winning is extraordinary? Well, uh, phase boots, which are picked up in 90% of all Mars games, and are in fact the second most picked up item under Blink Dagger, come in at a whopping 55% win rate. Phase boots wins you games. And it makes sense, right? For the same reason that plus 20 movement speed from the level 10 talent wins games, so too does an over 50 movement speed increase from phase. In fact, with it giving damage, and movement speed, and armor, it's almost like you're getting your level 10 and both level 15 talents at once. Fantastic item. Beyond that, we have Vladimir's Offering. As uh, discussed earlier, Vlad's is an aura item. It's an aura lifesteal item, meaning it compensates the loss of health due to soul ring. And it's an aura lifesteal attack modifying item, meaning that God's Rebuke on a wave of creeps will lifesteal on every single one of them instantly and give you up to 500 HP per cast. Feel free to completely disregard any other HP region option. I think we're covered here. After that, there's Blink Dagger, which I feel we've given plenty of reason to pick up just accidentally throughout all of this build. I mean, we haven't talked about him in an actual official capacity. It's just the Blink Dagger item just keeps popping up in many, many different scenarios. It's popped up while talking about every chapter of this mega guide. It helps farm, it helps get from lane to lane, it helps with combos, it helps counter some counters, it helps, it helps pull off clutch arena of bloods, and it allows for freedom of choice. And that's the most important thing. Plus, it opens you up to playing like Magnus can, where you can blink behind someone and skewer them back. Except your skewer has a much shorter wind-up time, and comes in the form of a spear. It's not an item that corners you into a specific way to play, which is ironic given the name of the video series, I know. But with blink, you can move on and get any, any other item. And so let's do that. Those other items include... BKB. BKB is basically the extreme answer to the question, if Bulwark gives me attack damage resistance, what oh what could I purchase to give me spell damage resistance? And there it is. Sure, you could get Pipe, you could also get Hood, or more HP, or any number of things, but that's a half measure. If you're wanting to do something in Dota, wouldn't you also want to be doing it in the best way possible? BKB covers literally all of your defensive bases. It blocks magic damage, it blocks most stuns and disables, it makes it so that you're unstoppable in the arena of blood, and it means that you will never have to turn and run. Because for Mars, Turning and running is the point at which we've truly lost our way. Beyond that, there's Radiance, a personal favorite of mine, as you know. The joy of Radiance is that Mars can kind of get it really early, no matter the lane. Uh, safe lane carry, mid laner, off laner, all three core positions will at some point level up Q and W. And that's all you really need to flash farm. You don't need items. Sure, boots and blink help transition between the camps or lanes or whatever, but overall you have more than enough damage to get a Radiance at of, I don't know, sub 14 minutes if you were really committed. Uh, Radiance is just great effortlessly. Think about the power pyramid and think about the heroes that hurt you. The top ones were heroes that burn mana, or heroes that can escape, or heroes that just stand their ground and deal more damage to you. But Radiance covers that all. Heroes that escape also use those escape abilities to kite you. Being a melee hero, kiting is a major issue. It's the same reason we advocate Radiance on Wraith King. And like Wraith King, Mars suffers from mana burn. PLs and illusion-based diffusal blade build and carries crumble to the AoE-ness of Radiance. Plus the 65 attack damage for you doesn't hurt either. For more damage, Nullifier works. An Assault Curus also counts as a hybrid between damage and the next category of tanky utility frontlining items. Other items for that include uh, Shivas, Pipe, Crimson Guard maybe, Blade Mail, Heart, and for Lockdown, you've got Eidos, and Abyssal, and Scythe of Ice. But then all of that compels when compared to that final item. Remember, with Refresher Orb, you can teach the enemy about graphs. Oh look, there it is again. 
How very interesting. It's that Venn diagram showing all of the people who will definitely be dead in a second. But now we're on the home stretch. Basically we're at a point where all I have to give are random facts that couldn't fit anywhere else. There's a couple of them, so would you mind if I just shotgun blasted them your way? Um, one, how can Mars win mid as a melee hero? Surely he'd be outclassed by heroes with a lot of range, like Sniper maybe. You bring up a good point, but funnily enough, uh, the inverse of a Venn diagram works here. When talking about how effective Mars is against enemy mid laners of many a different range, it's sort of like an inverted bell curve. Uh, if you get too close, you're going to be hit by God's rebuke. But if you're a sniper who hangs back really far and only comes in to get a last hit, you're actually in danger of being so far back that you're next to your tower and trees. And because of that, Spear of Mars becomes your weakness. Because most heroes stick to a certain rage innately, it means that Mars can sort of cater his skill build to what he needs. If a sniper hangs back, you make him pay with Spear. If he comes close, level up God's Rebuke. If you're up against a Mars, there's a perfect midpoint where you're safe from both of those spells. So be wary of that and choose accordingly. Two. As a support, offlaner, or basically any position that takes a side lane, uh, Mars is really good at countering supports harassing you from trees. Not only can he just do that thing where he turns and tanks your attacks, because you're up against a tree, he can't ever not stun you with spear. And because you're in the trees, you're not near your carry. And because you're not near your carry, and stunned, uh, you're now no longer alive. Rest in peace. Three. I've kind of found out that if you build too much utility and not enough damage, if you don't kill an enemy in 4 seconds, you don't kill them at all. Uh, Spear of Mars is an up to 3.8 seconds stun with a 14 second cooldown. And God's Rebuke is a nuke with 10 seconds of cooldown. Basically, because you don't want to have to use Arena of Blood for every single kill, if they survive the first two nukes and walk off the stun, you're not actually in a position to deal major damage to them again for another 10 seconds. You can die in that amount of time. Don't go in with all utility, even if you're a support. Get some damage. Four. Uh, Mars is stupidly good at pushing. Both spells in conjunction instantly kill a wave in the early game, with just God's Rebuke killing a lane by itself in the late game. Because of their spells, it means that they'll always have to be available again for the next wave 30 seconds later. 5. Pin people between a rock and a hard place. Or in this instance, a rock and a fiery burning wall of destruction. If you do it right, you can sort of make enemies bounce right off of the wall into a location that they can't occupy, like the Ancients or the edge of the map, and then they'll bounce right back and get hit again. In 12 months time, we will all judge the best Mars players by their ability to place down arenas and the smartest of spots. Mark my words. Quote me on that. Don't quote me on that. And six... Oh, here's just a bit of trivia. We're all done here. Here's a bit of trivia just to finish off. You know that little ditty that plays when Arena of Blood is cast? If you think it sounds familiar, it's because you've definitely heard it before. Or at least something that was heavily inspired by it. Uh, here it is in its full glory. This age of gods will soon meet its end. To the death! And here's where you recognize it from. Crazy, right? John Williams, when he wrote the original score for Star Wars, took inspiration from a thousand different places. But this very piece right here, this very piece came from an awesome old man named Gustav Holst, who composed the musical suite, The Planets. This particular part of the suite, well, um, that part comes from, and it's funny how all of this comes back around to this, right? The Mars movement from the suite. Play us out, Gustav. Hi. Uh, this video is coming out a month after Mars was, so in Dota time it means it's probably uh, like three years out of date. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I'd like to thank these following people for helping it uh, be made. Chris, 1996, Matt Masters, that guy who just copy-pasted everyone else's names and then just put that as his name, Miles Lou, Scar, Aaron Tang, Asbestos, Good Meme Yes, Jen Wilcos, Kim Nelson, Lincoln, Mark Hewitt, Shadow Sweetheart, Squirty McFlirty, Sterile Cheryl, Tefetu, Waiting for the Day That Eric, Spelt Wrong, Plays a 5 Second Dota, Aria, Christian Gennady, Christian Rudder, Claymouth, Corey, Quit Dodging Me and Come Back to the Internet, Damn Cleric, Davis Johnson is a Sad Bud Boy, Evil Motherfucking Jellyfish, Feliz, Gabriel Keynes, Grumman, Hatcrafter, Hey, That's Pretty Good, Hunterfield, 
Jonathan Scary, King Gizzard and the Shitty Wizard, looking for someone new to reference with my name, Luke, Tsunami Shadow, Malakot, Mini Shoof, that adorable elephant, Mr. Willy, Much Skill Very Pro Wow, Neutral Platonic Land Based Vertebrate, Nay, Orange Filter Sky, Paul Moran, Peyton Dean, Procrastination Studios, with a Z, Prod, Puneeth P, Red Mitchell, Rick Flurion, Woo, C Pod, Erman, Shiva's Guard, Slap a Leg of Lamb on the side for it, Sorinok, Taco Boom Dog, Ta Thomas Johnston, Uncommon Alias, Wazer 107, Whimsy Shy Magic, XD, Yabba Smiggy, Zephram Pillica, and a special thanks to everyone else who's donating to my Patreon. Bye!